I'm Steve Grumbine. I am the founder of Real Progressives. Um, for those of you who have experienced my uh, rants and so forth online, thank you for still tolerating me. For those of you who have not met me before, uh, I'll introduce you more in a moment in a couple slides from now. But I want to start this with a special video. Unfortunately, you won't be able to see the video that much, but that's okay. It's the sound that matters most, I think. You want me to so, in front of the you can do that. If you want to try and see it on this, it's fine. Um, Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. Take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt that we are going to have to pay back. That's irresponsible. That's unpatriotic. The government's irresponsible spending is turning us into slaves. You might well literally lock us into chains, at least our children. We gotta deal with this big long-term debt problem or it will deal with us. And uh, it is a, uh, I think it's a, I think it is, it is a, I'm just asking you, join us to stop this fiscal train wreck. Join us to protect our children from an inferior standard of living, from a crushing burden of debt and taxes. Okay, I don't believe in any of the tax cuts. I didn't want the tax cuts I didn't even want to put them in the class. Okay, because I mean, you know why? Because it puts a $400 million hole in the budget and we just can't afford it. And as we discussed deficit reduction, which is clearly a major issue, for decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future. And the deficit thing is real, and the debt thing is real. We are really in trouble on it at some point. Our need for comprehensive deficit reduction. The answer is not only yes, but no yes. It's debt that hangs over our head, a government that spends more money than it takes in. That's not sustainable. You cannot cut taxes or increase spending unless you can pay for it. The math of federal spending does not add up. And we are spending money we do not have. A debt burden uh, that's, uh, that's crushing us. Uh, to me, this is more of a moral issue. You can't steal from your kids and grandkids. Deficit. We think the deficit and the national debt are at a moral level. Well, national debt is America's biggest problem. In 1971, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. Gold was what we backed our currency with. Um, now, we no longer are on a gold standard. Back in the day when we were on the gold standard, there were these bank runs. People would freak out and they would pull all their money from the bank and there was no way to buffer. There was no way for us to absorb any shocks to the economy. So you would see, if you look before 1982, because it took from 71 to 82 for us to figure out how to work monetary policy to keep inflation relatively stable. And it has been like stupid stable, like Big Ben stable since 1982. But between 71 and 82, you have this wild swing of inflation, right? And I see people, it's the petrodollar. No, it's not. It's the, no, it's not. He didn't understand how to balance out federal money and how to keep the interbanking dollars at such a level that they could maintain inflation so that it was like, you know when you're riding in a car and it's got really bad shocks and you're like, doo -doo 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 -doo. that's what the world was like before they understood how to work within a sovereign fiat currency. Monetary theory, modern monetary theory is not a prescription, it is not a rule, it's not a law, it's not something to be done. It's not something to enact. It's not something that is a new policy or program or a new currency system. It's not anything new. It literally is. And it, just, it is a description of what is today. Now, the problem. Many people try to make MMT say things that it does not say. Modern monetary theory describes federal financing. It describes currency at all times. And as of now, right this minute, MMT describes a sovereign fiat currency. I, I have met with progressive Democrat uh, politicians over the past 25 years. And when I, when we start talking about budget deficits, you know, they, they completely understand that a sovereign government is not like a household, 
they understand that there's no necessity to balance the budget over the course of a year or ever. Uh, but they say, look, I can't say that in public. How do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase? So it's not a question of security. It's a question of the structure of a financial system which assures that the real resources are created for retirement. You create the reserves. Yes. And so, I mean, is that printing money? Not literally. Not literally. All right. <laughs> literally. All right, folks. So, if you could go ahead and put that light on, I don't think I don't feel falling asleep. It's after all, it's economics, right? So we don't want anybody falling asleep. All right. So, anyway, the title of this is obviously Modern Monetary Theory: The Future Is Now, Enabling a Green New Deal. So. We're going to go through in an introduction, which I'll explain in a second. We're going to talk about some common myths and uh, you know lies and legends and all the other stuff that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better, or possibly even that we've been spoon-fed for so long that we just accept this truth. Um, we are going to go into some essence of why in the world economics is so vital to our movement. Um, we're going to talk about enabling a green new deal. We're going to talk about barriers to acceptance, and we're going to talk about some action. So first of all, Green Party, thank you all very much for allowing me to come here. Truth be told, I am not a Green Party person. I am an independent, completely independent progressive, and I'm looking for a home. So this is my call out to you all, hoping that you guys and I can find a way to partner, because you guys have a wonderful, wonderful party. Uh, you've got a tough hill to uh, climb, given the way our electoral system is. But your policies are good. you just got some issues on the monetary side. We're going to talk through that. So anyway, let me explain who I am. My name is Steve Grumbine, uh, founder of Real Progressives, and I am a program manager by trade of work in IT. I've got nine kids, five boys, four girls. So everything I'm about to tell you all, so you understand, is not founded in some fetish about economics. It's not founded in some fetish about a certain way to do things. It's founded in a deep love for my children and for our planet. And the fact that I don't want to see them inherit what I've lived through, I'd like to see them have a much better life. Um, truth be told, I've been a Republican in my life. I grew up in a Republican household. I was a libertarian, followed Ron Paul for years, gold standard, Austrian, all the other nonsense that went with that. Um, I became a Democrat for a brief time. It was like looking out the window. I waved as I went by and then <laughs> jumped right back out. I couldn't stand it. It was just seemed like the logical progression. And now, now I'm taste testing the greens and others, trying to find a home for myself. Um, I'm only telling you this part of my education so you understand that I've been trained in all the neoclassical stuff. Okay, I've got a bunch, just a bunch of stuff, a bunch of debt. Um, I have a Master of Science in Technology Management. I have a Master of Business Administration with a focus in International Finance. I have a Graduate Certificate in Strategic Management of Technology and Innovation, a Bachelor of Science in uh, Information uh, Systems Management, and an Undergrad Certificate in IT Project Management. I used to be a PMP, CCMP, CCDP, CSE, and I love the Grateful Dead. So now you've got a full picture of who I am. And let me tell you why I'm here. As you heard in that video, we are inundated with lies from the mainstream media. Every single time you click on, you're ready to hear lies. No joke, every single time. And I used to peddle those lies, and I'm sure some of you in this room still do as well. I mean, it's just, this is what we've got. And we've got to break the holds of that, not just with media, but within the economics that keep us down. Um, our government finances are literally nothing like a household budget, yet so many of us, that's the only idea of what economics is. So that's the frame we put everything in. Um, and so when they say, we've got to reduce the deficit, and when they say all these other things, you say, 
yeah, if I don't have the money in my bank account, how the hell is the federal government able to do this? So, you know, automatically we start framing the issue in terms of the way we see the world. Uh, mainstream economic narrative is an absolute lie and it offers absolutely no hope whatsoever. If you think about what they tell you on TV, there is literally no hope. And for as long as I've been in politics and dealing with this stuff, I have heard the exact same scenario. Republicans won't let us raise taxes, so we can't do this. And then Dems and, and Greens even, well, we've got to raise taxes, my God. And so it's this back and forth ping pong game that nobody ever wins. And we pat ourselves on the back because we fought the good fight, and then you look and we've got no single pair. The environment's going to hell in a handbasket. We just had a massive chunk of ice break off in the Antarctic. Time is of the essence, but we're still patting ourselves on the back, fighting the good tax fight, right? Um, and, and quite frankly, there can be no Green New Deal using the economic storylines of our oppressors. And bottom line, we need a Green New Deal. I mean, this is, just so you understand, real progressives' sole focus is enabling a Green New Deal, Bernie Sanders platform, Jill's platform, mash them up, we're gonna bring a whole big team of progressives under one thing, wherever we go, that's our goal. And the bottom line here is, is that not only do we need it, I need it for my kids and my own existence. Um, knowledge of modern monetary theory, which is what we're gonna go over today, is the way to make it all happen. Not in some futuristic sense after we've torn down the bourgeoisie and we've done this and we've done that. Now, right here, right now, late. <laughs> All right, so some of the problems that we're gonna address, as you heard in the video, the national debt is unsustainable. You hear Ben Carson running around everywhere he goes saying how it's the number one killer of our you know, lives, our children, it's immoral, blah, blah, blah. You even hear Bernie say, we must reduce the deficit. I tried to get my Bernie imitation down. Um, I, I don't have a Jill one, but I could try, you know. Um, <laughs> we have to raise taxes to pay for stuff. Right? I love saying it like that because it's just so nonsensical if you understand. Uh, if we just cut spending here and there, if we just cut the military budget, then we could afford single bear. If we, if we just cut it over here, then we could afford green energy. If we just, no. Uh, we must eat the rich for inequality and fair share and stuff. Right? Uh, we must balance the budget. We could do quantitative easing for the 99%. Uh, we must end the Fed before we can do anything else. We don't have a sovereign currency. So, well, we're not going to we're going to deal with this head on. So let me tell you what modern monetary theory is. For those of you who have never heard this thing, unfortunately, that word theory gets in the way with everything but gravity and quantum physics and everything else. That theory word, somehow or another, they assume is barroom chatter. Yeah, it's just a theory, you know. No, it's it's a repeatable observation of how federal financing actually works beyond all the political mumbo jumbo that they throw at you to keep you accepting crumbs. It delineates the difference between currency issuers and currency users. In other words, somebody's got to issue the currency, right? And it's like, oh no, the Fed does that, right? The Fed is a creature of Congress. Congress created the Federal Reserve be our central bank, and we can get into that in a little bit too. It prescribes, it actually describes the money creation process down to the end. Describes the U.S. as a monetarily sovereign nation with a free-floating, non-convertible, sovereign fiat currency. The United States government is the sole issuer of its currency. Demonstrates that the U.S. can never have a solvency and it demonstrates the availability of real resources and not paper or keystrokes to constrain a currency issuing nation's ability to spend. We've got this nice little meme up here, MMT. You know, it's basically our nation's able to fund itself. It doesn't require an income. Um, and it, we can solve poverty, hunger, climate issues, green energy, universal health care, free K through 16 education, trade school, et cetera. I mean, and paid family and medical leave. So there's a lot of things out there that we all claim we want. The Jill on the campaign trail said she wanted. You all say you want. All right. 
some notable MMT economists. I'm not going to read all these names, but chief among them I want you to be aware of, Dr. Stephanie Kelton. Dr. Kelton is Bernie Sanders, uh, she was his top economist during the primary, now she's a senior fellow at the Sanders Institute, but more importantly, she's a heterodox economist fighting the orthodoxy, just like I am at a grassroots level, she's doing it in the upper stratum. All right, so one of the things, if I asked you guys what you thought taxes were for at the federal level, mind you, we'll talk about states in a minute, but at the federal level, most people have a bunch of different ideas of why they're paying taxes. They run around, they think, wow, we're paying, because in civilized society, we need roads and we need you know, libraries and we need police and we need air traffic controllers, et cetera. The reality is, going back even before 1946, but in 1946, Beardsley Rummel, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, wrote this really wonderful piece, and it was called Taxes for Revenue or Obsolete. He said, there was four key things that taxes were actually for. The instrument of fiscal policy to help stabilize the purchasing power of the dollar, to express public policy for things. You'll notice nowhere in there did it say to pay for things. Didn't need to pay for things. So one of the key mantras of modern monetary theory that you'll hear people talk about over and over and over again are federal taxes do not fund spending. It's a big deal, because if you think about it, if you're saying that we can't afford to give people a raise in Social Security, we can't afford to provide a federal job guarantee, we can't afford to transition away from oil-based products immediately uh, and save the environment, you know they're lying. You know they're lying. And so when you go in here, Stephanie Kelton and I traded some messages. I've interviewed her before. She's a wonderful person. But I got her to do the unthinkable. I got her to answer one of my tweets. <laughs> and I said, do federal taxes pay for anything? In a very, very succinct, no. <laughs> no. She did provide a JSTOR, which is a very, very long, peer-reviewed article that you're welcome to find if you come to Real Progressives. We post it all the time because we're in the education business. But this stuff, Think about this, I was a libertarian, Ron Paul, the world's coming to an end, Peter Schiff at 3 a.m. trying to get me to buy gold. You know, all, all these folks sitting there you know, trying to benefit off my misery. And, um, and it didn't make sense to me. You know, I'm, I'm a reasonably educated man. None of this stuff made sense. I didn't understand how they could keep bombing the bejesus out of the rest of the world. But somehow or another, when we talk about putting you know, a new tooth in this, you know, these horrible teeth that I have, we don't have the money, that's, that's socialism, man. Oh my God, we'll go broke, inflation, the world go crazy, Beamer Republic, Zimbabwe, we are gonna die. And, um, but yet, you never hear about that when they drop bombs in Afghanistan. You never hear that in Yemen. You never hear that anywhere else. You just hear that when we talk about fixing the water problems in Flint, Michigan. Or when we talk about bailing out Puerto Rico, who is a currency user stuck down there dependent on the federal government because they are also a net importer. So all their money leaves the island. You know, they get very, very little in tourism, et cetera, but they are a net importer. So where's the money coming from? How does Puerto Rico survive? Get to that. So one of the big things that you hear all the time is that debt's unsustainable, it's horrible, it's horrible, blah, 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 right? The reality is, is that what <laughs> The Fed sells treasuries. Why, why do you think the Fed sells treasuries? Why do you think they sold war bonds in World War II? Raise, Anybody? Raise cash? Nope, not, not even close, actually. It's a funny thing. They, they did it to pull money out of the economy. Mm -hmm. They did it to, to cool off an overheating economy. We were 100% employment, full employment during World War II. Factories were producing at epic levels. Everything was skyrocketing. They had to find a way to take something out of the economy, otherwise it was gonna overheat you. We're gonna end up with massive inflation. So they said, okay, if we sell war bonds, we can take money out of the thing, we'll give them a nominal interest on it, et cetera. Well, that's what they do with treasuries that they sell to China and to all these other countries and large corporations that buy these things. It turns into like a basic income for them, which is really stupid, right? But, but, what they're doing is they're defending a positive interest rate. They're not paying for government services. 
They're trying to keep price stability. They're trying to keep these borrowing rates at a certain level. So what do they do? They sell treasuries. So China, when they buy US goods and services, we don't have a bunch of yen, you know, random divvies and all the other stuff running through our economy. We have US dollars. So what happens is, is that when they buy US treasuries, they park their money, the US, the, the trade money that goes back and forth, they park that money at the Fed. And what's the point in keeping it parked there if they're not going to earn an interest? So they buy treasuries with that money helps the Treasury or helps the Fed keep interest rates down and it also helps whoever it is that's buying it to have a nominal interest. It's not debt like we know it because where does US dollars come from? Taxes? No. Banks? No. Comes from keystrokes. Comes from keystrokes. And so when we start fanning the flames and you realize that ultimately this is US dollars parked at the Fed. What happens if they dump those dollars? All of a sudden they go into the economy. They're going to buy things with them. They're not just going to dump them. That's stupid. That's their money. They, they want to be able to use it. We give some leverage, they buy things. That boosts our economy. So we consider the national debt actually our national assets. Those are the sum total of every untaxed dollar that have ever been in existence. And it's really, what is a dollar? A dollar is a tax credit. That's all it is. Because back in the day, the United States, all, all governments, had to make some decisions. How do we get people off the farm from picking potatoes and going fishing? We've got to entice them to go build roads. We've got to entice them to build libraries. How do we get them? Oh, we'll give them a gold coin. I don't want this gold coin. What good is it? Ah, we'll put a hut tax on you. You can only pay it in this dollar. Oh, crap, now I need this dollar. So that's what drove the need for the currency to begin with. So anyway, talk a little bit about reducing the deficit. For those of you, who knows what the deficit is? Anybody? Go ahead. It's the money that we spent into the, it's the money that the, the Congress uh, spent into the private sector. Very close. What it is is the difference between government spending and taxation at any one given year. Every year the deficit resets to zero. There is no ongoing deficit. It's annual and it's the difference between what is taxed and what is spent. And you think about it, they keep saying we gotta reduce the deficit. Well, by accounting identity, a public surplus is a private deficit. Double entry accounting, folks. That means you and I are broke when the government taxes. This sounds awful like, like libertarian logic for a minute. You start thinking because we've all been conditioned to believe we've got a tax to spend. We've got to pay our fair share for Medicare for all. We've got to pay our fair share. Well, what is a fair share? I don't know. You know, and, and you look, and, and federal spending adds money to circulation. Federal taxes remove money from circulation. Federal cutbacks plus federal taxes, no money in your pocket. That's the bottom line. That's why. What you've seen over the last 40 years, neoliberalism has really, really enjoyed us a lot. It's really, really profited off of our misery. Because what neoliberalism does is it forces the debt onto you and I. Instead of it being public space, it ends up private space. It ends up on our backs. So Milton Friedman had this idea, hey, quantity theory of money. If we put too much money out there, all of a sudden inflation, we're all gonna die. And reality is that's gold bug logic, right? Gold, you had a pot, pie of gold, right? And if you put dollars against that pie of gold, each dollar is worth the slice of pizza or whatever for that gold. But if you print more, we've got to slice that pizza finer, we've devalued the dollar. And that's what we get constantly. People think of it, they're clever, coming back at us, telling us about how we're devaluing the dollar. Wrong, because we're a sovereign, free-floating fiat regime now. We're no longer pegged to the gold standard that no longer applies. We're tied to the tax standard. In other words, taxes drive currency. So ultimately, if we have real resources that are being untapped, in other words, people sitting around, laying around, that want a job, can't get a job because there's not a job, and they tell you it's because there's no money. I mean, that's a lie. Money comes from the federal government. They make a choice to starve us out, to keep us begging for crumbs. And I think it was Ben Bernard, no, Alan Greenspan a few years ago said, uh, I think it was to Congress, hey, you know, if we, if we 
put too much money out there, and then people are not going to be insecure enough to keep the economy going, basically. So the idea here is to keep us desperate, keep us begging for change. And that's how neoliberalism lives, because we end up incurring massive private debt. And what happens with private debt? There's interest on that, right? The interest goes somewhere, it goes to the top. So when you're talking about income inequality, why do you think income inequality over the last 40 years has gone so crazy? Do you think it's because of taxes? Or do you think it's because they forced us to financialize our misery and pay interest on that money to the rentier class, to the Wall Street types? Think about it, the system's rigged, right? We're looking at it, this is where the rigging occurs. So anyway, I want to read this. This is from Warren Mosler, who's a brilliant man. He says, government fiat money necessarily means that federal spending need not be based on revenue. The federal government has no more money at its disposal when the federal budget is in surplus than when the budget is in deficit. It's all keystrokes, folks. So total federal expense is whatever the federal government chooses it to be. There is no inherent financial limit. The amount of federal spending, taxing, and borrowing influence inflation, interest rates, capital formation, and other real economic phenomena, but the amount of money available to the federal government is independent, independent of tax revenues and independent of federal debt. Kind of interesting. So I just had this gentleman on my show the other night. Any of y'all ever heard of Dr. Bill Mitchell? So Dr. Mitchell is one of the OGs of modern monetary theory. He's down in Australia, really neat guy, um, got some wild hair, um, but he is a bona fide socialist. This guy lives and breathes for uh, you know enacting so much um, that I'm sure Green Party people would know and love. Um, he came out and said, Budget deficits in a sovereign floating currency never entail solvency risk. A sovereign government spends by crediting bank accounts, and it never run out of such credits. And then we got this funny meme over here, just to keep it light. It's like, how can this replicator work without raising taxes? Quite simply, Congress authorizes the spending, and the new dollars are generated. Once the truth about MMT was realized, we stopped endlessly debating about how anything is paid for. I had another video that sadly we didn't get up here, but it was one of those things that showed people over and over again going, how are you gonna pay for it? 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 And that was a burning. So think about it. Jill's plan was even more robust on the spending side. Imagine if Jill would have been the one up there on that stage as opposed to Hillary. And Jill would have been trying to peddle a Green New Deal in front of Joe Q. Public. You're going to tell them, well, we got to destroy the Federal Reserve, and we got to go back to the gold standard to depress the economy, and we got to do this, and we got to do that, and then we're going to do this massive spending. How are you going to do it? Oh, we're going to raise tax. Every no, no, that's not how it works. This Green New Deal is so important to me that no amount of myths and legends is gonna block me from telling the truth. This is the salvation of the Green Party. Because unless you're ready to go in front of the television and tell the world, hey guys, we want a Green New Deal, but let us tell you the 40 things we've gotta do before we get there, before we can do a Green New Deal. Oh, we've gotta end the Fed. I'm sure there'll be no resistance to it whatsoever. So we've gotta end the Fed, that'll happen overnight, um, and then after we end the Fed, then we'll just go ahead and democratize the dollar, we'll green the dollar. And then we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll do the other. And you say your kids are now dead? <laughs> oh no, and the environment's uninhabitable? But damn it if we didn't end the Fed. This is the kind of logic that you've got to really walk down, unfortunately, because there's so many barriers to getting what you say you want. You, it's like this, it's a Boolean or gate, if you know what I'm saying here. There is no and, it's or. You're at this splice. Do you want to destroy the system? Or do you want a Green New Deal? They're mutually exclusive, folks. 
or you have to be honest and say, not for another 30 years or so. I don't think I can survive 30 years without a Green New Deal. You can't survive 30 years with a, without a Green New Deal because quite frankly, in my estimation, and I'm no environmental scientist, but there are many people out there far more notable these days than in the early days saying that a mass extinction is nearby. Now, if you think somehow or another we got time to end the Fed, green the dollar, do all these other things, and, and get around to fixing green energy, knock yourself out. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it for a minute. So let's go to the next slide here. This is one of my favorite ones. You know, people ask, so what does pay for federal spending? Kelton and her normal uh, short words. Congressional authorization triggers the payments. After that, coordination between Treasury and Fed ensure clearing. That's it, that's it. It's not, we gotta dig the money out of the ground. We don't have to friggin' somehow or another worry about capital flight. And what about, you know, the power of the working man? The federal government is God of the dollar. It's, it's just the deal. It's a monopoly issuer, it's the price setter. So this kind of throws things into a lurch because back when Marx was writing this stuff in volume one, which most people only get through volume one, um, you're talking about a guy who didn't fully understand sovereign money creation. It wasn't really what was going on at the time. So there was an entirely different flavor there and a lot of people skip this part and this is where the religion versus science part of economics kicks in. You gotta look at what is as opposed to trying to shoehorn the belief system into what you would like. Next one. This is another great meme. The U.S. monetary system since 1971 works like this. If Congress decides to spend, then the money gets spent. When's the last time you saw Congress spend money on us? For real. Forever. It's been since, I mean, we haven't had a man walking on the moon or whatever, forget the conspiracies. You know what I'm saying, we haven't had any, the big Capricorn one or whatever, we haven't had any of the real spending that we could do. We haven't seen any of the stuff. We haven't seen a New Deal America or even, you know, we haven't even seen LBJ, New so uh, Great Society stuff. We haven't seen anything at all because Milton Friedman put the brakes on fiscal spending and put it all into monetary policy, which is why you see so many people worrying about the Federal Reserve because they think monetary policy, which is interest rates and bank lending, is somehow or another the same as fiscal space, which is government spending, two separate animals. And how can you blame anybody for not knowing that? Because first of all, it's like watching grass grow paint dry. Most people check out. But this is the deal. And the reality is federal government checks don't bounce. When you hear people say a dollar's worthless, I'm like, dude, I've got this box that I collect worthless dollars. <laughs> and if you're so convinced your dollar is worthless, I'm here to take it off your hands. I don't want you to be burdened with such things. <laughs> yeah. do, do not allow that to burden you. <laughs> All right, now this is a great one. I'm gonna stand up for this. This requires a little bit of thinking. So uh, hopefully it's not too late in the day. But this right here is a picture of the economy. And it, unfortunately, this doesn't go all the way through present, okay? But Petalina Cherneva, a wonderful economist who's also an mmt -er, um, put this together for Stephanie Kelton. And what it describes is three sectors of the economy. Public sector, private sector, and rest of the world. Now, you'll notice that wherever the private sector surplus, that's our disposable income, wherever that surplus disappears, Immediately on the heels, there's a recession. Reduce the deficit recession. Got to cut spending recession. Now, I don't know about you all, but I lost everything during the Great Recession. Lost a 17 year career. I lost the marriage. I had to drop out of a PhD program. I had a BMW. 3i without reverse sitting in my driveway so people would pass by and they say oh he's wealthy he must be whatever he's 10 years old it was upside down it had no reverse i couldn't sell 
My grass was six feet high. I may have been hanging from a rafter in my basement. Nobody bothered stopping by. I guess they didn't like the beamer. Um, ultimately, it destroyed my life. So you'll notice each time that the public, you and I, private, go into debt or deficit, and the federal government goes in surplus. Think Bill Clinton. Think about all the joy of Bill Clinton. Y'all say he's a neoliberal? You're right, he is the neoliberal. He's king neoliberal, okay? And what he did was he cut public space. He cut spending, he reduced the deficit. He did all these things that every Democrat under the sun parade. You still see those jackwads that occupy Democrats bragging about Bill Clinton reducing the deficit, right? Anyway, then there's this other thing. People always say, well, modern monetary theory sounds good in theory. But what about, that's only in a closed economy. That doesn't really, you don't really count the external stuff, do you? It's like, of course we do. We're not stupid. We're not. Honest. So that includes our trade, balanced trade. Right? So what is the United States? Anybody know if we're a net exporter or a net importer? Import. Import. We're a net importer, aren't we? To the tune of about 500 billion a year. 500 billion a year leaving the economy. Sounds terrifying. Not if you understand sovereign economics. Not if you understand MMT. But our government does it. So what do they do? They sit there and cut back when that happens. And they hurt it even more. And they contract the economy, shrink it, and destroy it, and make you and I suffer. Now, in this case, when you see that we're a net importer, and when you see that private debt is through the roof, $1.2 trillion dollars, and student debt. Folks, 1.2 trillion. That's a lot of cheddar. And guess what? That's all federal debt. Because it got rid of the alt loans. So you've got these federally backed student loans. The federal government. Where's the federal government get its money from? Keystrokes. Keystrokes. <laughs> so all these kids are walking out of high school. They're subsidizing corporations and their training education. And development by going to school on their own dime. There's no more apprenticeships. You don't walk into the mailroom anymore and work your way up like it used to be. No, you better have a damn bachelor's degree. You're not getting in the door. So we've subsidized corporations through our own private sector debt. Anyway, this right here is what we call sectoral balances. So if you ever wonder how we know when to stop spending or where when to start spending and all that stuff, this is how we predicted, MMT predicted, the, fall, the, the crash that occurred. Bill Black, William Black, he's the guy you see on the, the big short, stuff like that. MMT here predicted that. It's all because of sectoral balances. All right. Let's go to the next I can't see it. Can you go to your back? Sure. Point to me on that where 2007, 8 is. Well, you figure here's December uh, 07 to June 9. And okay. you'll see that the government sector was in surplus, private sector was in deficit. As we headed in, this is, this is it, the recession. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. So we've had pretty much non-existent inflation now for a long, long time. They've tried everything under the sun to make inflation. <laughs> I mean, they've literally tried everything. I mean. And you hear people talk about quantitative easing and all that stuff. But what do you guys think quantitative easing is? Just, just throw yeah, some ideas out there. They want us to think it's print more money. Buying buying bonds. We're giving bank loans. So, keystrokes. Well, it's <laughs> a pretty good answer. It's debt swaps. It's like rearranging chairs on the Titanic, right? I mean, you're just you're just moving types of money around. You're not adding anything to the net. There's no new net financial asset being created. You're just changing where the money sits. And they have been doing this forever, and they have not been able, they have not been able to create any kind of meaningful inflation whatsoever at all. But, but isn't it the 12 
they do an awful lot of that. They do an awful lot of things that really are stupid. Quantitative easing is not a good thing. I'm not here advocating for it. So I just want to make sure you understand, though, that it's not printing money, that it's not adding new money. What it is is just swapping and moving things around. It's rearranging the chairs on the deck. No, no, it's not. Yes, it really is. It's taking bad debt off of Citibank and JP Morgan Chase and giving them reserves. That's not the only thing it's doing. Do you think banks can lend reserves? Which banks? Any banks. Do you think banks actually lend out to the public outside the banking system? Do you think they lend reserves? The 12 Federal Reserve Banks have the reserve of their member banks, and it's only used in check Twitter. It does never leave the banking system, correct? It doesn't leave the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. It does not. That's right. Absolutely. Because we don't use reserves. That's right. That's right. They're just uh, the other side of the double entry accounting, nothing more. That's well, really. No, no, no. Yeah. If Citibank and Morgan Chase have bad mortgage debt, they can't There's no question. Quantitative easing is not something I'm advocating for at all, just so we're on the same page. But you did not add new net financial assets to the economy at all. You have zeroed out. All you've done is shift the debt around. No, now the banks. All right. You just shift the debt around. So let's move on to the next one because bottom line is that ultimately real resources is what constrains our inflation. If we don't have bread, for example, Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe, all these places you always hear thrown out. What you end up having is a situation like in Zimbabwe. They took away the farms from the farmers. They lost the capacity to actually produce food. It wasn't that they printed money. It was that they had no resources to spend that money on. So everybody was competing for the scarcity. In Weimar Republic, you had debts denominated in French francs, okay, because of the Treaty of Versailles, not because of printing all these rice notes. You know, that you had a situation where their productive capacity once again was completely compromised, okay? So, again, we've got none of that in the United States either. All right, so this is one of my favorite ones. Yeah, can you repeat that again? I mean, what's the entry and money supply if not just, just putting something on out there that doesn't really exist and then having us pay for it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The entry and money supply, for example, when George Bush went ahead and said we're not going to go ahead and report that anymore, which was basically all the derivatives and all the financialization that took place. How do you account for that? What are you looking for uh, to be accounted for? Well, what, what, what all the derivatives, for example, that was a big portion of that whole well, game the, show. That well, we currency saw. is created and destroyed. They destroy it. So well, yeah. hold that hold that thought for just a second. Let me get through this real quick. I'll get right back. Anyway, Stephanie Kelton speaks to the fact that Dem lawmakers are always obsessed with trying to repatriate the taxes that have been offshore and stuff like that. So they're trying to pay for things with taxation once again. What she says is this is both cruel and unwise. Why pretend that our power to care for planet people, planet people rests with the so-called billionaire class? It doesn't. We can fund health grants, social security, Medicare, infrastructure, child allowances, a job guarantee, etc., without their money. I mean, if you really want to neuter these guys, why not show them how inessential they are? And instead of treating them as a repository for the headstones of the progressive agenda. So invariably, we get stuck in this rut, and we do absolutely nothing, and then the people suffer, because nothing is ever done to us. Not done for us, I should say. Um, we get trapped in this thing, and then everybody focuses on that, and then once again, Medicare for all is left completely unhappening. So I talked about this a little bit ago. It's like student loan debt is $1.2 trillion as of 2017 in climate. 
Congress controls the purse strings. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gives them that authority. For us to do quantitative easing for individuals, we would all have to have accounts at the Fed, because all they're doing is shifting around accounts at the Fed, shifting debts, like what you were saying. But they don't do that to us because we don't have accounts at the Fed. So they would have to take, for example, the student loans, maybe they take the borrowing agencies, et cetera, take those accounts over there and wash them. Um, but they are not actually going to be able to do that for individuals because we don't have accounts at the Fed. That's not how it works. Um, and quite frankly, when you've seen other bills like TARP and stuff like that, that wasn't just the Fed acting on it. It's an act of Congress. So Congress abdicates its responsibility constantly and allows us to instead look at these solvency issues. The thing that you were talking about, quite frankly, with the bailouts and so forth, all that stuff and the derivatives, which you were speaking to, every bit of that really lies straight on the lap of Congress. Every single one of those things is the deregulation of the banks that has occurred over the years. The repeal of Glass-Steagall, the allowance of all the shadow banking, on and on and on. But those, those acts of corruption do not stop. And I want to make sure we understand that we don't conflate these two items. That doesn't change. That's a problem. Put it over here. That is a problem. It's a separate problem, though. The problem over here is that we've been led to believe that we can't have anything because the government is broke. We've got to eat our peas, as Obama said. Okay? I mean, seriously, this is a recurring theme. Think about Hillary Clinton, that cackling hat, sitting there laughing. Ha, ha, ha. And, and she's sitting there talking, you know, oh, Bernie's plans are all pie in the sky. Anybody remember that nonsense? Yeah, 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 this is what is going to plague yeah. the progressive movement continuously. How are you going to pay for it? Over right. and over and over and over. Everyone, there's not one person in this room that doesn't know that the environment needs a very, very bad triage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Saying it nicely. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this room knows for a fact that our health care system is foobar. We don't have to get on the same page, and we all agree. We all agree that we need to revamp our energy grid and our infrastructure. We know we need to make college affordable or free, which is my preference. I'm into citizen rights. I'm not a big welfare guy. I want to see citizen rights, 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 everything right, healthcare are right. You know, and all of a sudden, once you eradicate the pain, this other stuff stops you know, happening, stops mattering. Anyway. Um, move to the next one. All right, so this is, this is one of the things that I think is, is this guy na is named Roger Malcolm Mitchell. And Roger is, um, he's not an mmt -er, but he's kind of a stepsister, stepbrother of MMT. Um, he has a school called Monetary Sovereignty. And there's a lot of times where the two overlap quite nicely. And this is one of these things that I've Long since, this is what opened my eye up to the currency issuer, currency user paradigm. And it's like, it's not a theory or a hypothesis. And you can look around the world. When you see Greece, for example, Greece is in the situation with the Troika. Why? Because they gave up the drachma. They're no longer a currency issuing nation. They're now on the euro. And now they're subject to, look, they have no authority over their money. They can't create their own money anymore. They have to borrow it, literally borrow it, against a, a, someone that is not on their side, not their central bank. So a monetary sovereign government has the exclusive and unlimited power to create its sovereign currency. Monetary sovereignty is the foundation of economics. The United States is monetarily sovereign, exclusively unlimited power to create the dollar. China, Canada, Australia, and the UK, and Japan are monetarily sovereign as well. They have the exclusive, unlimited power to create their sovereign currencies. The US government created the dollar from thin air by creating from thin air all the laws and rules that made the dollar possible. Being sovereign over the dollar, the US can do anything it wishes with the dollar. It can make the dollar equal to three euros, two pumpkins, one partridge, and a pear tree. The federal government's power over the dollar is unlimited. And then if you read further into the article, he goes into what states are like. You know, Illinois, Cook County, and Chicago are monetarily non-sovereign. The dollar is not their sovereign currency, and they do not have the unlimited power to create dollars. France, Germany, and Italy are also monetarily non-sovereign because they're at the euro. All right, 
So something I want to point out, I don't know if you all realize this, but the Fed doesn't operate in a profit. They, they're, they're, the money that they make, they pay off their, they pay their expenses, but then the rest of it goes back to the Treasury. 2015, uh, they put 97.7 billion in profits back to the Treasury. Um, look, I, just so you all understand, MMT has no position on where the Fed lives. We don't really care because it's just a scorekeeper, okay? So if you want to bring it back to the Treasury, so be it. But then when they do something neoliberal, then the word's going to be, the Rothschilds have entered into the government now. Instead of it just being, it's, it's never ending. It will always go on. There will always be someone that doesn't understand something, so attribute it to something else. So wherever you want to put it, knock yourself out. Um, but as of right now, the Fed is a creature of Congress, okay? And this line right here, it, it really is largely just a scorekeeper. When the Congress says spend, it spends. And it will not tell them no. Now there's something that occurred a few years ago to avoid the debt ceiling, which is too much, too deep. But uh, the whole idea of minting the platinum coin, the trillion dollar platinum coin, putting it into the treasury box and you never have an issue, again, with the debt ceiling. It's a beautiful thing, uh, but we can talk about that in some other broadcasts later. Um, so I, I wanted to bring this in, this is kind of interesting. You know, I used to always talk, you hear everybody say printing money. It's just constantly talking about printing money, using the term printing money. It's like, if spending, if Congress spending is printing money, then when we tax it, it's unprinting money because taxes are destroyed upon receipt. They aren't recycled, they don't go back out, we don't reuse them, we don't give them to poor people. Um, you know, when you're paying your social security, you get that nice little uh, report card that tells you how much you've paid in. At the end of the day, when you collect your first Social Security check, guess what you're getting? Brand new dollars. There is no crumpled up old dollar in a piggy bank at, you know, somewhere. It's all new money. That, again, was something that FDR used, another mind game, um, where he basically made people feel like they were paying into a system, that they had ownership of it, and that they would fight for it. All right. So something I thought was interesting when we talk about enabling a Green New Deal, we look right up here in, in Michigan and we see people without clean water right now. And this is all over the country. Wherever there's poor people, there's environmental racism. And we just use those poor sections of town as a dumping ground. Uh, you know, we, we, we let them fall to pieces. And the reality is, is that Michigan could be fixed right now without even flinching, it could be fixed right now. Wouldn't have to raise a nickel in taxes to do it. This is a picture that came from an article the other day of the iceberg breaking off of Antarctica. This should terrify you. It's terrifying. You let me know about those derivatives while the iceberg floats across. I'm worried about survival right now. And um, there's a million problems out there, right? Uh, there, I, I, there's more problems than I will ever be able to say in a lifetime. We just have to do order of operations algebra to figure out which one comes first. And if you think that worrying about the derivatives is key, as opposed to spending on 99% fixing that bad boy, then we're on different sides of the coin. Just the way it is, okay. We don't have to always agree. But uh, I want to survive. It's, it's this thing I got going on. I think most of you actually want to survive. I just don't think you realize how up against the wall we are. So, you know, we talk about do we have time, you know, and this right here is our present world on oil and all the other stuff. This is a renewable world. Again, I've said I'm not an environmental scientist. I'm not a renewable energy expert, but I do know economics. And when I think about it, there should be nothing standing in our way of making that happen. This right here is an imperative for life, not just some good economic concept. And so, if you know that taxes are deleted, shouldn't we be doing everything under the sun to make sure that, that happens, as opposed to that happening? Yes. When you hear politicians say, how are we gonna pay for it? We're gonna raise tax on this, we're gonna do that. And you know that you're setting up immediately the Norquist pledge that Republicans have signed on to. No new taxes, period. 
Are you prepared to die for your tax war? Are you prepared to let the planet become uninhabitable for your tax war? Think about it. I'm not saying don't have that tax war. I'm saying it's an unnecessary battle because unemployment is the way that they use to kill us through suicide, etc. But if we had a federal job guarantee, now all of a sudden when people go destitute and they lose their jobs and the grass is six feet high and they got no reverse in their BMW, they don't have to wait 18 months to find another job and lose everything. You have a federal job guarantee. Jill talked at length about an employment office on every corner in every community. Why not? Why not? Why wouldn't we have a federal job guarantee? And you think about this. You remember what I said. When people lose their job, what happens? We go in private debt. We have to survive. We find ways to pay our electric bill, to get food, whatever. Now all of a sudden, the federal job guarantee with living benefits made by the communities, jobs not working for the man, public purpose, that each community determines what they value, and then people work for it. That right there also saves a lot of lives. 45,000 suicides a year from unemployment. You want that on your hands? I don't. We're almost out of here, but so the federal job guarantee eradicates involuntary unemployment and income inequality, the antidote for neoliberalism. And so, you know, sadly, there's this battle between the UBI team and the job guarantee team. The UBI is considered status quo because what happens if everybody gets a certain amount of money at some point in time, just like a school voucher, right? Rich find 2,500 extra, and they go ahead and take their kid to the next school. Same thing with this. So the object is to eradicate the power that the capitalists have on us by pegging our economy to the labor standard. And this is my final slide. We're not on the gold standard, and thus the constraints imposed are no longer in play. We have a sovereign, non-peg, non-convertible fiat currency not backed by oil, gold, beeswax, or chicken necks. The Fed is a creature of Congress, not a private banking cartel. We aren't broke, and we can never go broke without an intentional act of Congress. The debt ceiling is a garbage construct used for politics to force tough decisions and is a relic of the gold standard era. The national debt is not like debt as you and I know it at all but is instead savings accounts at the Fed for people who want to save in U.S. dollars. A balanced federal budget would in fact make us like Greece by taking away our ability to deal with shocks to the domestic or global economy. Federal taxes do not fund spending, but they are essential to maintaining the value of the U.S. dollar. Taxation allows the U.S. government policy space to provision itself. Full employment comes before inflation. Money growth does not cause inflation. So on the basic side, federal taxes, because they don't fund spending, that means our nation is self-funding, which means we can't go broke, which means we can solve poverty, hunger, climate-related issues in green energy, universal health care, free college, trade school for all, a federal job guarantee, paid family and medical leave, student debt, and one more thing, Green Party supports reparations, don't they? Hell yeah. How are you going to pay for it? He <laughs> jokes. That's right. <laughs> All right, folks. I, can I ask you a cool question? You can. Uh, I've got my student loans up through the loan servicing, and I looked at my statement lately, and I noticed like my the amount of money in my payments, a staggering majority of that went toward interest. And I'm wondering if you know where to, who collects that interest. So you've got these agencies that are passed through, okay, like Nelnet, FIA, and others. They take their uh, the money and they do different things with it. They do grants and so forth. But the rest of it is it's like a tax. It's just like a tax. Well, so that is, is it profit going to someone's pocket? I mean, literally? No. Some of I mean, obviously Agency. these agencies. I'm, I'm you ready for me to roll, huh? No, no. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a very small handful of people, but I do have a couple of people who want to.
All right. Because there's something clear around that loans are, are, are publicly guaranteed or privately administered. Right. So the like, interest is fixed by the, the private institution. So yes, they're making money off of that interest. So, so real quickly, before I go any further, I'm going to expose my friend, Tim Fong, from the Modern Money Network. He joined us. Thanks for doing that. Um, um, I also want to introduce yeah. Sunday Descalia, who works at Real Progressives as well. Yes. And uh, Diane Moxley, who is here, um, she also works with us. And then Tony Parrott is also a member of our gang. Gotcha. Um, so, um, sir, I'm sorry, you have the hat on back there, and you asked about derivatives. Yeah. Yes. I'm yes. sorry. Yeah. Oh. Steve. Steven. Stephen is the name. Stephen, Stephen, excellent. Steve squared. All right. So what I wanted to say about that is, listen, there's an awful lot of problems in the world that require significant, significant regulations. And our government has abdicated its role in that. We have gutted every meaningful banking regulation known to man. And it's been a bipartisan screw job. So we have got to have a state-of-the-art Glass-Steagall some sort of thing. Warren Mosley has a phenomenal banking proposal, and these guys at Modern Money Network have tons of these things. Basically saying, banks, you do this, and you don't do anything else. This is what you do, and that's that. Public banking, we are not opposed to public banking. We're not opposed to these things. What we're trying to say is this. We want to get the Green Party to understand that in order to enact your Green New Deal, it's got to be priority number one because lives are on the line for that. The rest of it's semantics. We can worry about the, the other stuff later. Right now, if you if you only got so many shots to go for, right, and you saw that piece of ice breaking off from Antarctica, you, you gotta make some choices. I just wanted to know what the famous thing is. I think it's ever for. Yeah. Is it the biggest part of these Steve, Steve. Yes. Uh, well, just to, to sort of build hey, on the yeah. Hey, there's plenty of places. Let's keep this going. Yeah. Let's, yep. let's go on a fine spot. I'm interested to hear what he has to say.